This week, we join Jeff Johnston as he heads to Minnesota for a different kind of RV destination where you get hands-on experience in numerous old world trades at the North House Folk School. Then, how many of you still have trouble backing up your trailer? You're not alone. Michelle Fontaine shows us how she solved the problem with the installation of a backup camera. And the nice thing? The camera system was under $300. On Pause On Board, Dr. Fitz explains all about the delectable and unusual things dogs seem to want to eat from time to time, especially when they're out in the wilderness, and what to do if your dog does start choking. Later, we're all familiar with vintage RVs, cars, and so on, but what about vintage drinks? Jeff Johnston learns all about a vintage beverage that's been around for years that you can still enjoy now. Then, Ivan Schmatter shows us how to make one of those delicious vintage drinks. These stories and more on this week's RVing Today TV. Closed and Spanish captioning where available is sponsored by Forest River. Follow the river. The next destination on our Minnesota adventure is the North House Folk School. Working on arts and crafts projects while they travel is a popular pastime for RVers. A lot of those RVers also enjoy learning more about it while they're traveling. But we're here in beautiful Grand Marais, Minnesota at the North House Folk School. The North House teaches a variety of crafts and skills that may seem all but forgotten in today's modern world. Let's take a closer look. Whatever your handcraft interest, there's probably something for you at the North House. Its location on the shore of Lake Superior is inspiring and good for the soul. The group of modest buildings that house the classrooms harken back to traditional small-town America in style and decor. The school is as much about why the classes are important as it is about what it teaches. Because not that long ago, our, our ancestors knew quite literally how to make their lives with their hands. Um, looking at the landscape around them, they could grab onto the resource they'd need, working with their neighbors, working with their family, and they could carve a bowl they needed to, to brew the ale for the community celebration. They could cut the beams to raise the timbered barn where the livestock would stay. Um, they could create the traditional toboggan that would allow them to travel across the northern landscape on the snow and the ice. North House Folk School is an educational nonprofit that teaches traditional northern crafts. Our mission? Enrich lives and build community through the teaching of traditional northern crafts means we take people on all kinds of learning adventures. Traditional timber framing, wooden boat building, skin on frame kayak building, cedar strip canoe building, wool blanket shirts, blacksmithing, moose hide mucklucks. During our visit, the wooden boat class and the small house construction class were actively in process. Students learn about structural and aesthetic design elements that are in step with the small house movement growing in the U.S. Skills learned here make it possible for students to build their own compact residences. I think that would look fantastic because we'll put another, well, we come in maybe with two lights at the end of that and now it'll just go straight into this dark. Wooden boat building instructor Ken Kosick takes students through the craft of assembling a wooden strip canoe. In Ken's view, it's as much about the experience as it is the end result. It's nice to be building these crafts, but the most important thing is it's a father-son working together here and there's a father and son working together there for 11 days building a, a canoe and a kayak that's going to be an heirloom for their family but more importantly I think is the fact that these two people are going to it's a bonding thing that's going on and so it's something that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives and for me that's more important than the canoe or the kayak that would end up as an end product so there's a lot more going on here than just building a canoe or a kayak uh, 
these two gentlemen are having a good time with the other two people, another father and son. And of course, I'm enjoying myself more than anybody else. So otherwise, I wouldn't be here teaching the class. RVers can drop by and take part in classes as brief or as involved as they choose. It doesn't have to be a long-term time commitment. Classes happen at North House year-round. Um, every month of the year, almost every weekend of the year. Um, and there are 19 different teaching themes. Classes range in length from a half day to two weeks. If you want to do some soap making, guess what? It's a half day class. If you want to do an introduction to wood-fired bread baking, it's a half day class. If you want to go home, take home a cedar strip canoe, well, that takes just a little bit longer. <laughs> in addition to being open for coursework 12 months of the year, we're open to visitors. And many people will stop by while they're uh, traveling the North Shore to learn more about the school. Classrooms are open, and so visitors are welcome to be curious and see things that are going on. And in the high season, early June to late September, we actually have uh, mini classes that happen three or four days of the week that people can sign up for. Evidence of the timber framing classes can be seen throughout the facility. Regardless of the marvelous things you can actively learn at the North House, you'll also be tempted to take part in social time by the campfire or just sit in the swing seat and enjoy the view of the lake and the world passing by. When Bedford launched Aquachem, it didn't take long before it became the number one selling holding tank treatment for over 50 years. Until now. Meet Aquamax, Thetford's new generation of holding tank products that works even better and are also campground friendly and environmentally safe. Looks like a new number one is taking over. For more information, visit Thetford.com. Want more RVing Today? Then visit RVingToday.tv. Besides our weekly show and extended segments, you'll find additional stories and videos along with insightful information on what's new and what's happening around the world in RVing. From luxury RVs to unique camper vans, and from RVing with pets to RVing with kids, you'll find it all and more in RVingToday.tv. Welcome, I'm Michelle Fontaine, and I've been an RVer for four years. The one thing I didn't have a lot of confidence in was backing up the trailer. So I got a backup camera from RecPro. This camera is under $300, has a seven inch full color high resolution image. It's a digital wireless camera. So let's get it installed. Most new RVs come pre-wired for a backup rear camera. Today, my friend Jason Chasco is going to help me. <laughs> he is going to install the RecPro camera. I'm going to start taking this apart, slowly, piece by piece, just to see what we have. Try not to lose any of these little bitty screws. Uh, there's four screws that looks like it's holding this plate on. Inside of here, I have a power cord and a couple more pieces of wiring. So this will be the power cord that the new unit will plug into, which ties into the coach lights. One thing I did notice, and this is always good to double check before you get too far in, the plug are different than on the Rec Pro. So what we're gonna have to do is snip these off, shorten the Rec Pro, and we're just gonna put it together with a pair of butt splices. Since the wire is so small, I'm just using regular red butt splices. Safety note, make sure there's no power on these. You don't want to short it out to blow a fuse. Alrighty, well what I just did is I snipped the end off because they're not standardized and crimped on the Rec Pro connector. I do like the Rec Pro connector. It's got a positive twist, so when we put it on, you screw it on there. You don't have to worry about just the friction of it falling off. So 
Just use caution doing this. This wire is really small and can be easily snagged and or accidentally cut. So take your time, work slow, work smart. Now what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be mounting it up here. I'm actually gonna just use a Sharpie here and mark out where I want it with the camera on, still on the mount, just so we have a better idea. So I'm just gonna put a couple quick marks right up top here so we know where we wanna go with it. And I wanna be, want be able to have some nice gentle bends in it and not have pinch wires. So going right about here will work. I'm gonna to try to square this up by eye as best I can. There is an adjustment in here, so I will try to center these uh, as we do so, because nothing like looking at a wonky camera angle. There, I'm about centered. There we go with that. Now comes the fun part where I need to have about seven hands. Yeah, this is, would be a, a decent do-it-yourself or project with some basic tools. Now I'm gonna work on getting the camera mounted on here. Put the power plug on, screw that down so we can make sure we get everything wrapped up nicely. This is the antenna wire. It's got a little SMA antenna that will go on it. Then we'll get that worked out here in a couple minutes. Camera mounted. And then once we get the antenna on it here, we'll be going up to the cab to get it actually synced with the Bluetooth. You'll need to keep your ladder here because there is a sync button on the back. The U bracket that's on it right now probably isn't needed. We'll see here in a moment. So what we're gonna do is comes with some nice super duper double stick tapey. We're gonna put that on there. Peel the backing off the double stick tape. Now remember, this is probably going to be a one-shot deal, mm -hmm. so let me know where let me know where you want me to put it. We'll hold some pressure on it. And Michelle now has a Rec Pro backup camera. <laughs> this camera, at least on this unit itself, her grand design, when the marker lights or the headlights are on, the camera will be powered on that. She can have her headlights on. Me personally, when I'm towing, I always have my headlights on for safety of myself as well as visibility for other people. So this is great. She now has a camera behind her to help cover those blind spots on there. Michelle reaches over and turns off her headlights right now. You'll see the camera will go blank. There we go. Thank but you, Jason. You're welcome. This has really increased my confidence, both on the road because it eliminates blind spots in back of you and of course, backing up. Forest River, we not only build great RVs, we build award-winning RVs. Check out our complete product line at forestriverinc.com. Forest River, begin the journey. At Norcole, we realize that some of your favorite RV destinations are off the grid. And Norcal refrigerators are uniquely designed with that RV experience in mind. We call it Freedom Unplugged. To learn more about our Norcal RV refrigerator line or to find a dealer near you, visit our website at norcal.com. Welcome to RVing Today's Pause on Board. I'm Dr. Fitz and this is Sammy. Does your dog eat things he shouldn't? Unfortunately, this is a common problem that veterinarians deal with on an almost daily basis. Dogs eat everything from socks, rocks, human medication, and everything in between. Some of these things can pass through without causing too much of a problem. However, some items can be life-threatening for your dog. In this episode, I'm gonna discuss common items that your dog may eat and what you should do if it happens to you. The main worry we have as veterinarians is, is the item toxic? For example, your dog may eat animal bait that's been left out. Usually these baits are really tasty and all too enticing for your pet. Dogs also have a habit of finding their way into our prescription medications or over-the-counter pain relievers. In any of these situations, we want the item out of the stomach as soon as possible. 
a little later, I'll discuss how this is done and what you can do when you're traveling. Whether or not your pet vomits the item, you should get in contact with a veterinarian or pet poison control immediately. Time is of the essence in these cases. If you have it, the label that came with the bait or the medication and how much of it that you think your pet ate can be extremely helpful. Keep in mind that some baits and medications can be life-threatening for your pet. Generally, there will be some type of blood work needed and potentially hospitalization depending on the situation. Another common toxin that pets find extremely tasty is antifreeze. Antifreeze tastes very sweet to your pet but can be deadly with only a few tablespoons. Especially if you're traveling in an RV, make sure that your antifreeze is put away and you've thoroughly cleaned up any spills. You can try to make your pet vomit after they drink antifreeze, but getting them to a veterinarian for testing is vital. Antifreeze can cause kidney failure within a matter of days, and once your pet starts to feel sick, their likelihood for survival is lower. With antifreeze, prevention is the best medicine by keeping it out of reach of your pet. Another worry we have as veterinarians is will this item get stuck? Sometimes we get lucky and small items like socks, underwear, or small pebbles can pass through. But more often than not, your smelly hiking socks that your dog just had to eat, or that tasty looking rock over there, get stuck. A blockage of the GI tract will make your pet very sick. They'll usually vomit, stop eating and defecating, and become extremely lethargic. Sometimes we can make your pet vomit the item back up, or give them a bulky meal to help the item pass through. However, you should contact your veterinarian for advice based on the individual situation. For instance, if an item has sharp edges, it may cause more damage coming out than it did going in. Every situation is different. So how can you make your pet vomit when they have eaten something bad? In a season one episode of Paws on Board, I detailed items you should have in a pet first aid kit. Included in that kit was 3% hydrogen peroxide and a syringe. The peroxide will be used as a stomach irritant to make your dog vomit their stomach contents. This can be life-saving if you're not able to get to a veterinarian quickly. The general dose of peroxide is about one teaspoon per five pounds of body weight, but we generally don't give more than three tablespoons at a time. Once you give the dose, wait about 15 minutes. If your dog has not vomited, you can repeat the dose one more time. If your pet still does not vomit, bring them to a veterinarian as we have other medications that can more effectively cause vomiting. Keep in mind that inducing vomiting is usually only effective within the first few hours after ingestion. So if it's been longer than that, your pet should be brought in for evaluation. Some final notes. You should not induce vomiting if your pet is acting sleepy or lethargic, as this can be very dangerous for them. You should also not induce vomiting if your pet has ingested chemicals such as bleach or other strong cleaning solutions. These can actually cause serious burns on their way back out. As I said earlier, our canine friends love to eat a variety of things, which make every situation different. When in doubt, contact a veterinarian or reach out to ASPCA Pet Poison Control at 888-426-4435. For more information about traveling safely with your pets, visit rvingtoday.tv. Tune in next time for more pet health information. I'm Dr. Fitz. This is Sammy. Thanks for watching Paws on Board. Want more RVing Today? Then visit rvingtoday.tv. Besides our weekly show and extended segments, you'll find additional stories and videos along with insightful information on what's new and what's happening around the world in RVing. From luxury RVs to unique camper vans and from RVing with pets to RVing with kids, you'll find it all and more in RVingToday.tv. When Bedford launched AquaChem, it didn't take long before it became the number one selling holding tank treatment for over 50 years. Until now. Meet Aquamax, Thetford's new generation of holding tank products that works even better and are also campground friendly and environmentally safe. Looks like a new number one is taking over. For more information, visit Thetford.com. It's no secret that people are crazy about anything that has to do with vintage these days. 
And now, when you've been out having a wonderful day out enjoying the outdoors with your RV, you get back to camp, you're ready to sit back and relax, you can also enjoy a vintage beverage. This new product is a quinine tonic concentrate and it has historical roots dating back to the 17th century. And here to tell us all about this new Ruby D tonic is the man who makes it, David Donald. Thanks, Jeff. David, what, uh, what's the story behind this? I understand it's pretty old stuff. It's pretty old. It goes back to the uh, early 17th century, around 1630, when it was discovered in Peru. Uh, most people know it as quinine from the cinchona tree. Okay, quinine, yeah. which is a major ingredient for helping to fight, uh, to fight uh, malaria, fight correct? Some, yeah, and so the British really used this um, when they went to, especially in, in India, they had their soldiers taking a daily dose of quinine, and they would get it in a quinine powder, um, mix it up with water, and have to drink it. Quinine mm -hmm. is terribly bitter. Oh boy. And so they soon discovered that, well, let's add some sugar to the water, and then the officer says that, well, we have our daily um, gin also, ration of the, yeah. daily ration of gin, and so let's add some gin to this, and hence the gin and tonic was born hmm. thanks to the British military. Oh, very cool. And became quite popular. Well, it looks like uh, this is a pretty interesting array of materials here, uh, twigs and seeds and whatnot. Twigs so, and seeds uh, and bark. Tell us a little bit about what goes into this. Well, we, as you know, we have uh, four different flavors, and so some, some of these go into each one. We have the juniper berries, we have the lemon bark, um, or zest, the uh, lemon grass, we have orange zest, allspice, and the main things are the cinchona and the citric acid. And the cinchona bark is where you get the quinine from. Okay. We have uh, the, the spiced, which is very similar to the original, but it has a much higher quantity of, of the herbs and spices in it. And then there's, we, and then the, what's this? This, this is, is uh, extra bitter. The okay. ec and the extra bitter is probably as close to what you would have had um, in 150 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Because there's very little other than the cinchona, a little bit of sweetener, citric acid there's very very other very few spices in it well there you have it the end of the day you're ready to relax now you have something new and vintage to try out with your gin and tonics and it's been fun looking at the ingredients and learning about the history but now because we're getting a bit thirsty we're going to toss it over to Ivan Schmarter and Ivan is going to try out a couple of different recipes with this and uh, see what you can come up with so Ivan I hope you enjoy it hey Jeffrey J thanks vintage style craft tonic how cool is that when one's presented with such a delightful mixer like this Ruby D tonic, what else is there to do but make some killer cool and refreshing beverages? To take on a coffee drink that's becoming all the rage. In fact, it's been called the new iced coffee, but really, I call it a coffee tonic. Stay with me now, it's really delicious. Let's give it a go. The first thing is we're gonna put ice in our glass. Four beautiful cubes, maybe more, just fill the glass up just like that. Next we're going to take our original Ruby D tonic and we're going to put a full shot just like so right in the bottom of the glass. Next up we're going to add some seltzer water about a third of the way. I'm going to stir this up just so the tonic and the seltzer gets nice mixed and a little bit chilled with the ice and now comes the piece de resistance. I have a shot of espresso here. I'm gonna pour this right on top of our seltzer tonic mix. I've got a pretty little garnish to put in it, this little piece of chocolate and a raspberry, just to make it nice looking. And there you have it, our coffee tonic. Let's give it a try. Well, with two terrific tonic drinks, I think it's time to relax outdoors and take in this beautiful day. David, thanks for making this fantastic Ruby D tonic. It's fabulous. Jeff, David, come on over. It's party time. See you later, mates. Cheers. For additional information on any of the stories or products seen on this week's show, visit our website at rvtoday.tv. Don't forget, you can also watch RV Today on Roku, Amazon Fire, Vimeo, YouTube, or any of our station streaming services. This has been another fun production.